Hi, welcome to our first online micro lecture. We're going to be starting with chapter one, and chapter one is designed to be a broad overview of what microbiology is. We're going to do it in two parts, like a lot of our videos, they'll be broken into segments. And in, in part one, we're going to take a look at some real general characteristics, such as what is microbiology? Um, what is studied in microbiology? We're going to be talking about some of the cell types that exist on Earth and what are the characteristics of those. Um, we're then going to finish up part one with an overview of infectious diseases. And I've got some examples to go with some of the different um, areas of the body that microbes are well known to infect. So we'll look at some characteristics of the body as well as some of the examples of microbes that are known, uh, some of the common microbes that are known to cause infection. In part two, we'll kind of take a different angle on it. In part two, we're going to look at topics such as the nature of pathogens. <clears throat> and with that, we'll look at, for example, how microbes interact with each other and other organisms like you and I as human beings. So that's one of the things we call symbiosis, how things interact together. So we're going to look at that. We're going to take a look at some new research. One of the things I'll mention is uh, throughout the semester, starting with chapter one, is that microbiology is in a really dramatic period of change. And um, <clears throat> it's evidenced by lots of new research and lots of new um, clues to how microbes affect us that were completely unknown to science and medicine even five years ago, certainly 10, 15 years ago. So we're going to take a look at what are some of the more obvious trends that are being researched. There's certainly a lot of things that are still kind of fringe that we won't get into that are not quite as well established yet. But we'll look at some of the newer things that are just a little bit more established as far as being credible. Um, <clears throat> an example of that is uh, how microbes might affect our behavior. This is something that scientists are now starting to understand better that microbes in our gut can actually affect the way our brain works and actually affect our brain chemistry everything from appetite to mood and possibly even more so we'll talk about that um, we're going to move on in part two to emerging diseases which is a, a topic it relates to just how um, how another infection is always around the corner and how um, science is always kind of one step behind the next outbreak or, or the next new uh, type of uh, unknown pathogen to emerge. So we'll talk about that and that will lead us into the last topic which is antibiotic resistance. So that's a <clears throat> pretty relevant topic for most of you going into the health field. So antibiotic resistance is probably something that you're familiar with. We'll talk about that. What are some of the things that are causing it and what are some of the other issues related to that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start here in part one and take a look at the intro to micro, starting with what is microbiology. All right, so chapter one is titled Introduction to Microbiology. So it's a broad chapter and it's designed to fit lots of uh, topics into a short period of time so that you get a kind of an, a broad sense of what it's about. So let's start with the definition. Uh, microbiology, but based on our textbook definition, is defined as the study of living things too small to be seen without magnification. So with that definition in mind, let's take a look at that for just a second. The study of living things, so I've underlined that as a key part of that. Um, so it's a subset of biology, which is the study of living things, period. Okay, so. Um, too small to be seen without magnification. Okay, so uh, small living things. So to just to put that into context, it is really a subset of biology. So biology is a broader field, the study of living things, period. Microbiology is really just a more specific kind of narrow focus on small living things. Okay? And as we'll see, some even what we consider non-living things, such as viruses. So we, def we describe these quote unquote things uh, as microbes or microorganisms. <clears throat> now there's lots of different types that fit within the, the category of microbe or microorganism. So we'll get to that here shortly. For now, we'll leave it as that. Now, from a common everyday standpoint, we often think of these as things like germs and um, probably other terms we could use there, but think of something negative, harmful, toxic, poisonous, and that's kind of how we tend, I think for most people anyway, how most people tend to think of microbes. One of the things I want to set off start off with in this chapter, however, and I'll try and mention this throughout the semester, 
is that while it is important to recognize that there are pathogenic microbes, something that we already know, the truth is the vast majority of microbes are actually harmless and sometimes even beneficial. So there's a question down there. It starts off with a statement, the use of this term is inappropriate, and then the question is, why is such a term, such as germs, inappropriate? And the reason is that most microbes are actually not harm or not harmful, excuse me. Most microbes are harmless and or actually beneficial. So it's actually only a small percentage of microbes that are considered harmful, pathogenic, disease causing, whatever you want to think about there um, in most cases. So uh, although the number is not defined, it, it's probably something around 5% of all microbes that are currently estimated to cause disease and infection. And uh, in many cases, it's only under certain circumstances, but <clears throat> about 5% are even capable of causing disease. So that means about 95% of all microbes are, con are either considered harmless um, and or even beneficial. <clears throat> okay, so we'll talk about some examples where microbes are actually thought to help the body in many ways. So microbiology, even though it's within the field of biology, it's still a relatively broad field itself. So for example, microbiology can be parsed out into even smaller topics such as medical microbiology, focusing mainly on infection and disease. Uh, public health and epidemiology focuses more on the spread of disease and the transmission and the patterns and the geographic locations and things like that. Immunology takes a look at how the immune system reacts to microbes as well as just other aspects like um, allergies or autoimmune diseases, things like that. Industrial microbiology, agricultural microbiology, and even environmental microbiology tend to look at how microbes operate in the environment for the most part. Industrial microbiology has more to do with how microbes can be used for make, to make commercial products. So as an example that you'd be familiar with, uh, alcohol is fermented using yeast primarily. So yeast are considered a microbe. So an a, a, um, application of industrial microbiology would be studying how to ferment alcohol using yeast. Okay, And that's just one example. There's many others, but that would be kind of what you'd find in the industrial microbiology, uh, industrial microbiology field. Uh, environmental microbiology is pretty much just what it sounds like, how microbes uh, operate in the environment, so like soil microbes, um, pond microbes, algae, uh, things of that nature. So um, for this class, we will tend to focus on the medical, immunology, public health, and epidemiology. Uh, these, so these first three here, really, is what we're going to focus on within this class. We will get into some of the other ones down here, but less so, and uh, tend to focus on more of the human interaction of microbes and how that relates to health and disease. But I want you to understand it is much broader. Okay, so next thing is why is microbiology important? Now that's kind of a loaded question because obviously there's a subjective context there. So from, from, my, from my opinion and, and kind of the way I, uh, I want to draw it up here anyway, start out with the idea that microbes are ubiquitous. <clears throat> So I want you to ask yourself real quick before I tell you, what does ubiquitous mean? Okay, don't look it up. I'll tell you here in just a second. What does ubiquitous mean? Most people probably aren't familiar with this term. It's not a term you hear every day. So ubiquitous means found everywhere. Okay, so go ahead and write that down. Ubiquitous means found everywhere. Now you might find slight different, slightly different variations of that definition online. Sometimes you'll see it defined as found everywhere, all at once or um, existing everywhere simultaneously, something like that. But the idea is that something is ubiquitous if it's found everywhere. Um, now, why is that significant then? The implication there is that microbes are literally everywhere we go. So they are in the air, they are on the soil, in the soil, on the ground, they are uh, on virtually every surface that we touch and come in contact with, they are on our skin, they are in our mouth, they are in our hair. And literally everywhere we go, there's some kind of microbe present. Now, for a lot of people, that brings up ideas of germophobia and, you know, maybe images of people wearing masks to prevent infection. And the idea, as I said before, is that most microbes are harmless. So even though they're ubiquitous, the truth is most of the time they're not really a problem for us. But it's significant because what it does mean 
is that we always have to be aware anywhere we go that there's a chance of an infection or transmission of disease. Now that's especially important in a medical context, especially if you're working in a hospital or a clinic where not only do you have the chance to spread disease, but you also have individuals who are sick with weakened immune systems and who have a likely um, and more likely chance of actually uh, succumbing to the infection and possibly um, in, a, in, a, in a really serious kind of way. So microbiology <clears throat> is something that's often required because it's, there's an understanding that if someone who someone who's going into the health related field needs to really be aware in a little bit more specific context of, of what exactly you're dealing with with these microbes. Most people really, from my experience as a microbiology teacher, most people really don't know much at all about microbes when they come into my class. And what they do know is often based on what they hear in the news, what kind of some of the public perceptions are. And it's often a really good idea just to kind of get a better look at what they are, how they work, and from there, hopefully, you'll better understand how to prevent disease and kind of better understand how it happens when it does occur and, uh, and, and what are some of the more intricate details that relate to the different ways a disease might progress, for example. Why, say why one person might get an influenza respiratory infection and possibly die from it, whereas someone else could fight it off within a couple of days and be fine. So. These are some of the, the ideas that relate to ubiquity, as well as why microbiology is thought to be important. Okay, so the next part here we're going to look at are the major types of microorganisms studied. Now there's a lot of different microbes out there, millions upon millions of different specific species, uh, many thousands of, uh, of different um, groupings and, and um, what we call genuses, which are kind of specific groups, kind of like cousins and second cousins in relation to each other. But from a starting point, we're going to look at the, the broadest groups. So these are, the, there are seven groups here. You're going to want to write these down and you're going to want to know these. So you have to look at these and study them. Now we'll, we'll go through each one. So as you go through the, the class, and especially here in, in the first chapter, you'll get to know each one better. Okay, so you're not just going to have to memorize this list. You'll get to know details which will help you understand it. But starting out, we're just going to list them here. Now each one of these is considered a microbe only because it's small. Okay, it's too, most of these are in, in general are too small to be seen without magnification. There actually are a few exceptions here and there. I'll explain those as we go. But uh, that's really all they have in common. Okay, each one, as we'll describe, is distinctly unique to the others and has its own kind of characteristics that are relevant to how it operates and, and even how it can cause disease or sometimes why it doesn't cause disease such as algae or an example of a microbe that almost never causes diseases only on rare occasion. <clears throat> okay now before we get into some of the characteristics of those seven groups there I actually want to start with a little bit more of a broad overview of all cell types. Now I know a lot of you probably haven't taken general biology it's not a requirement here, so I recognize that while we'd like to have you take it, not everyone has. So if you have taken general biology, this should be a little bit of a review here, and some of these terms should be familiar, and if not, then you might have a little harder time understanding it. You might have to go back and look at it a second, maybe third time, and even uh, go back to the textbook and review some of that there. Now, all living organisms on Earth are made up of at least one cell. Okay, and that's one of the things that helps us define a living thing. A living thing has the characteristics of has the characteristic of being made up of cells. Um, now, a lot of microbes have only one cell. Okay, but the all living things are made up of at least one cell or more. You and I, for example, uh, on average, have something like a hundred trillion cells. Okay, so there's can be very very few as little as one, or uh, seemingly infinite, like a hundred trillion. Now. The, regardless of whether you have one cell or 100 trillion cells, when we look at life, we can actually identify all living organisms in one or two categories based on the nature of each of their cells. Now, the reason we use these two categories is because since every organism has at least one cell, we can apply these characteristics based on the characteristic of their cells. So, for example, all living organisms can be broken into two categories called prokaryotes and eukaryotes, 
which are categories that are indications of their cell characteristics. Um, let's take a look here at some examples. Prokaryotes, our first group, these are considered the quote unquote simple microbes. And these are always defined as having one cell. So they're always what we call single cell. So oftentimes microbes fall into this category. Uh, they're single cell, they're relatively simple compared to our eukaryotes over here, which we'll talk about next. Uh, one of the examples of being simple is that their DNA is somewhat um, unco it's uncovered, it's floating around in the cell without any sort of structure around it, <clears throat> and they don't really have any sort of internal complexity. So they have a cell, at least one, um, but they don't have any real complex, they don't have any complexity to that cell. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are, are more evolved. They have a more complex nature to them. So they're considered complex in comparison. So eukaryotes can occur in both single and multicellular forms. <clears throat> so there are single celled organisms that can be either prokaryote or eukaryotic. Multicellular organisms, on the other hand, like you and I, are always eukaryotes. So just to clarify, single celled can be either group. <clears throat> so in other words, just because a microbe is single celled doesn't necessarily make it a prokaryote. It could actually be eukaryotic. However, if we see a multicellular organism, all of those are what we consider eukaryotes. Okay, so eukaryotes are just a more broad kind of um, more common grouping really. And as we'll get further here, you'll see what I mean by that. When we talk about complexity, one of the things that is indicated here is in reference to the DNA in what we call cellular organelles. So let me go to the next slide to show you what I mean by that. So here's a couple basic diagrams of, of two cells here. Here's a prokaryotic cell on the left and a eukaryotic cell on the right. And it's, defined, it's labeled here as an animal cell, but this, to clarify, is actually a, a eukaryotic example here. <clears throat> so when we look at the prokaryote, Here's the cell, what we call the cell membrane. It's also got a cell wall around here. It's kind of the boundary of the cell. Um, kind of like the skin, if you want to think about it that way. And inside there, what we really have is just a bunch of stuff floating around. Now the nucleoid here, that's a fancy word for the DNA. So going back real quick when it says the DNA is not enclosed by a membrane, DNA is just kind of floating around inside the cell here. Now if we jump over here to a eukaryote, it's not obvious from this picture, but the DNA is actually located inside this little structure here called the nucleus. So the nucleus is a specialized housing unit, so to speak, for the DNA. So what we find is while both cells are considered, both, both types are, are considered a cell, they actually both have DNA. Uh, the way in which the DNA is organized and the, the structures of which surround it are actually quite separate, quite uh, distinct. So here we have just kind of a loose aggregation of DNA inside of this cell. And over here we have more of an advanced apparatus that's designed to hold the DNA. And as we'll see in later chapters, even regulate the DNA and kind of dictate how it functions on a more advanced level. Now this other one here, organelles. Organelles are the other structures around the DNA. So, for example, mitochondrium, the cytoskeleton, Golgi apparatus, uh, this thing here called a peroxisome, centrosomes. These are all considered uh, different types of organelles. Organelles are actually derived from the word organ. And so I said that the, the cell wall and the membrane is kind of like the skin. If you want to think about your own body, you can think of the membrane and the cell wall as kind of like your skin. We see this a membrane over here as well. Uh, here it's, it's not very obvious, but it's pointing to the plasma membrane, which is a structure around the outside here, kind of closes everything in. You can think of that as like the skin. And inside we have the fluid, kind of like your blood or your body fluid. And then what we find is that with the eukaryotes, they don't really, or excuse me, prokaryotes, they don't really have much else. They kind of have like a loose skin and some fluid. And then the DNA is kind of floating around in there. And that's basically it. Now, I'm, I'm simplifying um, for the sake of clarity here because there are exceptions. But for the most part, that's really all a, a, a prokaryote exists of. It's just those basic things, a membrane, uh, some fluid, and DNA for the most part. Now, over here on a eukaryote, we have 
the membrane, we have the fluid, which is just this kind of stuff here in the middle floating around him. And then we have uh, what we call organelles. And organelles, again, is derived from the word organ. And when scientists first started looking at these under the microscope, they realized that each of these eukaryotic cells has these separate units inside of the cell. And they thought they were, they look kind of like organs, kind of like how your, your heart has a certain function and your liver has a certain function within your overall body. They realized that these organelles within the eukaryotic cell are similar. The mitochondria, for example, has a, has a function that helps the overall cell, kind of like an organ helps your overall body. So that's the major difference between these two, is the level of internal complexity and the different aspects that we see in relation to that. Now, one other thing before I move on here, this is not drawn to scale. On average, although there's variation, on average a prokaryotic cell would actually be about 10 times smaller than a eukaryotic cell. So just to give you a quick visual here, if this were a eukaryotic cell, a prokaryotic cell in comparison would probably only be about that big if they were placed side by side. So this would be eukaryotic and this over here would be prokaryotic. There are exceptions. Sometimes you see a eukaryote that's smaller than a prokaryote, but on average the ratio is usually about 10 to 1 in perspective. So that, that figure there was not drawn to scale. That's just so that you can see some more detail there. But, uh, but I just wanted to point that out. Now, now there's other stuff here I didn't mention. You know, there's this big tail here if you're wondering about that. And these little structures around the outside. Those are also features that are significant, but they're, they're not quite as common to all of them. So while they are shown in this picture here, uh, they're not part of the defined characteristics. So we'll, we'll learn about those uh, actually starting in Chapter 4. But I didn't mention them simply because they're not part of every prokaryotic cell. Okay, so we're going to go through the examples here, just back up real quick, of our major types of microbes studied. And I'm going to relate that also to the types of microbes in relation to whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So starting out, we're going to look at the prokaryotic microorganisms. Now what I want you to know is that there are actually only two types of prokaryotes. And the two types of prokaryotes are called bacteria and archaea. So those are the two types of prokaryotes. The first one, bacteria, will be actually one of the major focal points of the class. And of the two prokaryotes, bacteria are by far the most significant, at least in terms of health and disease and everyday interaction. Bacteria are one of the more common types of microbes that we find. And when we talk about microbes being ubiquitous, being everywhere, we find that it is the bacteria that are most commonly found anywhere we go. So just to clarify real quick here, and jump around you too much, but when we say microbes are ubiquitous, what that means is that everywhere we go, we will find some kind of microbe. Doesn't necessarily mean we're going to find every type, but we'll find one of these or a group of them, but at least one of them basically everywhere we go. But what we tend to find most commonly are the bacteria. Okay, So while we could find all of them, or maybe just one, what we tend to find if, are the bacteria. So they tend to be the most common type of living organism on Earth. Now these microbes are partly defined by the fact that they're single-celled. And as I kind of said redundantly here, are uh, found virtually everywhere. Now bacteria are very, very small. So even though they are literally, literally everywhere we go, every day we come in contact with probably millions of them, if not billions, we don't ever know it. We don't ever see it. And even, when, even if they make us sick by chance, it's certainly not obvious that bacteria are responsible. So I put a few pictures here. These aren't going to give you the full picture of what they look like, but it's a good starting point. These are both real images, by the way. This, this looks kind of like maybe a CGI, computer graphic image or something, but that's actually a real uh, microscope image, a high-resolution image. And what you're seeing there is a cluster of what we call kind of rod-shaped bacterial cells. They've kind of just grouped together here. Don't, not a lot to it there, but that's, that's kind of what they would look like if you could actually see them with the naked eye. Over here is a group of bacteria on the head of a, on the tip of a pin. 
is what this actually is. So another really high resolution image. And it's hard to say exactly how much of the tip of the pin there. Uh, from my understanding, they got just the very, very tip of the pin. And from there, you can see how small these bacteria are in relation. So you can oftentimes cover the tip of a pin with millions of bacteria. This one's not very saturated, but if we were to cluster them all together, kind of like they are here, we could probably fit um, close to a million cells on this surface here if we really condense them tightly. So they're very, very, very tiny. Millions can fit on just the tip of a pen. Now, with that in mind, then obviously we need a microscope to see them. So it's not very easy to recognize that they're there, but, uh, but it's uh, important to recognize that they are. They're ubiquitous. Now, the exception to when we can actually can see them is when they grow into large colonies or, or what sometimes what we call biofilms. So you, you can't see the individual cells, and even a small cluster like this would be invisible to the naked eye. But what you actually can happen is when they become really large in terms of a clustering, they become what we call a colony. And then sometimes that colony can stem into what we call a biofilm. We'll, we'll talk about these later, especially in lab, we'll learn about colonies and in biofilms. Uh, when it comes to biofilms, we'll talk more about those in chapter four. Um, but it's kind of like if you were, let's say you were flying from uh, an airplane uh, at about 30,000 feet. If it, was, uh, if it wasn't too cloudy out, if you were over kind of a clear area, if you, were, if you were to look down, you would not be able to see individual people. You'd be too high up. However, if you were to see a large cluster of people, maybe uh, like a city, and even some of the structures around that large cluster, uh, then it would start to become visible to you. And that's kind of like what you're seeing when you look at a colony or a biofilm, is you're actually seeing a large mass of bacteria that have grown into a big visible cluster because there are so many of them. So if we just type in type in bacterial colony, you kind of get an idea of what we're looking at here. So if that wasn't a real obvious visual, or if it didn't, if you weren't able to visualize that, here's a quick visual for you. Here's a petri dish. You'll see this in the lab as we go throughout the semester. We'll culture all sorts of stuff. And each one of these clusters here, each one of these circles, is what we call a bacterial colony. And each one can literally be made up of millions of, of individual bacterial cells. In fact, there could actually be hundreds of millions per each colony here. So the number of cells is really kind of hard to actually um, understand. It, it seems almost impossible, but that is actually the numbers. I mean, these each one of these, again, could be anywhere from 10 to 100 million uh, in, in size. Here's a better, here's a different picture here. Uh, a, scanning electron, a scanning electron micrograph is a high-resolution image, kind of like I showed you before. And this shows you a real small colony just starting out. And imagine that just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's really kind of what you're looking at though. So that's kind of the exception to when you can see them with the naked eye, when they grow in large colonies like that. Um, this is reiterating what I've said already, bacteria are one of the most common microbes. Other microbes that we'll discuss tend to be a little bit more specific to each location. So for example, algae tend to be found in aquatic environments. Okay, so um, bacteria are the truly ubiquitous microbe capable of growing in almost any environment. And one of the reasons why we study them most more heavily than other microbes is because of their higher degree of, of, of ubiquity and, and the more of a presence around the world. Not to mention our own bodies, not to mention they are responsible for lots of infections and things like that. Now the other prokaryote, to go back to the two types here, remember we have bacteria and archaea as our two types of prokaryotes. The other type called the archaea, while they are considered a type of microbe, they're very uh, niche and that means that they're not commonly found. So these tend to be found only in certain environments and for that reason they're actually referred to as extremophiles because not only are they only found in certain environments, they tend to be found in relatively hostile environments. In other words, they tend to be found in really, for example, really hot environments, really cold environments, really salty environments, environments with lots of acid is another example. So they tend to occupy niches where other microbes have a really difficult time growing, and oftentimes where 
no other microbe or any organism for that matter can survive or very few for that matter. So they've actually been coined the term or given the name extremophiles for the fact that they tend to love living in extreme conditions. Now that does make them kind of interesting. Here's an example where you might find them, by the way, this is in the hot vent, and uh, it's a hot vent in Yellowstone National Park is an example where you might find these thriving actually in this relatively hot uh, acidic kind of water here. So they're actually fairly interesting, but not that relevant to disease and health and uh, anything in relation to infection. So since we want to focus on what's a little bit more relevant in that sense, we tend to skip over these for that reason. So we won't spend hardly any more time talking about these. So I just want you to know the very basics of archaea. I want you to know that they are prokaryote. I want you to recognize that they're often referred to as extremophiles. And the reason for that is that they live in harsh extreme conditions. Okay, other than that, we will depart from those now. And I might mention them here and there, but we won't spend hardly any more time talking about them. So next we're going to talk about some of the eukaryotic organisms. So start off here, <clears throat> we want to start off by identifying what are, the, what are the actual four broad types of eukaryotic organisms. And what we actually find is that, going back just a real, real quick recap, all living things are either a prokaryote or a eukaryote. Okay, so no matter what type of life form you're looking at, it can be categorized as one of those two things. So then we already said the, the prokaryotes are the bacteria and the archaea, okay? And that's a, two fairly specific things. So, in other, so what I'm getting at here is literally everything else, if it's not a bacteria or an archaea, everything else is considered a eukaryote. So this is by far the most diverse of those two groups. Prokaryotes are fairly specific. Eukaryotes are very, 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 very broad, okay? So all of the animals are fit into the eukaryotic grouping. All of the plants fit into the eukaryotic grouping. All of the fungi fit into the eukaryotic grouping. And this fourth one here called the protease, which consists of two smaller groups, the algae and the protozoa, they also fit into the eukaryotic grouping. Okay, so all of these things are uh, what they have in common, even though these are all very different. Obviously, you and I might not think animals and plants have much in common, but in fact, at the cell level, they all have this sort of advanced cell organization and that is why they're considered in the same grouping here as eukaryotes because of, even though they're very different at the macroscopic level to the naked eye at the microscopic level they actually have a lot in common and they're actually very similar uh, in their microscopic structure so that's why they're all in the same group there okay so and just to clarify one more thing not all of these are studied in microbiology the vast majority of animals are not. There's one exception, and those are actually the worms. We'll talk about those. That's actually considered an animal. We won't really look at any plants. Uh, we will look, however, mostly at the protease and the fungi. This will be the primary focus of our eukaryotic uh, microbes. So algae and protozoa, and then the fungi will be our focus here for the eukaryotes. Okay, so the first group on the eukaryotic list here are the algae. Algae, in my, the way I like to think of algae, I like to think of them as miniature plants because most of us are more familiar with plants than we are algae. Uh, but really they have a lot in common, starting with the fact that they are both considered photosynthetic. That is, both plants and algae are what we call photosynthetic. Now that's a general biology topic, so once again, if you didn't have that, it may not be quite as obvious as to what it is, but photosynthesis is basically how these types of organisms take sunlight and convert it into food. They all, I mean, uh, to clarify, sunlight, CO2, and water, and they make uh, glucose, the type of sugar, which is used for food. So it's a unique type of metabolic process that's really only found in a handful of organisms, uh, those two being one of the two of the biggest. So that's what they have in common. That's a great way to think about them because it helps you kind of understand them a little better since again we most of us understand plants much better algae can exist everywhere on uh, i shouldn't say everywhere they can exist on land uh, and or the water but they tend to exist primarily in the water or in an aquatic environment so there are algae that sometimes can grow in the soil or even on the tree bark and places like that but most of the time algae are going to be found in the water 
and oftentimes they become noticeable in the form of pond scum, quote unquote. So when we look at a picture here, we see all this green stuff, you might call it moss, you might call it pond scum. Uh, that's actually like kind of like a big bacterial colony, but more like uh, a big colony of algae, of which there could be many different types in there. Um, <clears throat> algae, sometimes also known as phytoplankton, by the way, they are significant, although often overlooked. So in other words, most of us don't think about them for probably for good reason, which is just fine. But since we're talking about them here, I want to point out a couple of the things that make them significant to not only just to microbiology, but to really life on Earth as a whole. Number one is that in an aquatic ecosystem, they make up the base of the food chain. What that basically means is that other organisms feed off of them and give them a source of nutrients. And um, those organisms then can be preyed upon by larger organisms. And so what they do is they act as kind of a food source for lots of more complex, larger organisms that are found uh, next to them in the aquatic environment. Here's a quick visual for you. This would be a uh, ecosystem you find in the ocean or a, a, a bay or um, maybe even, well, since you've got a killer whale, this would be a, a large ocean like the Pacific Ocean. But the idea is that algae exists at the bottom of the food chain. So small microbes, small organisms rather, like krill, things like shrimp, will feed off of the algae. And then they serve as a food source for even larger organisms, smaller fish, squid, and you can see lots of other examples here. And then those organisms serve as food sources for even larger organisms, right? So something like a killer whale actually gets a lot of its nutrients from algae, albeit indirectly. So the nutrients actually come in from the sunlight. They actually, the sunlight provides nutrients for the algae, and then the algae pass off that energy and those nutrients to other organisms higher up the food chain. So uh, there's a kind of a uh, dispersion of energy starting with algae, moving all the way up to the higher levels of the food chain. They're kind of like the grass of the ocean and the grass of the pond and, and the lakes and the rivers. So they, they help feed other organisms. So uh, another reason is that algae produce about half of the world's oxygen. Now we often think that oxygen comes strictly from trees or probably we don't think about it, maybe we assume that. And it is true that plants and trees pr produce lots of oxygen, but it's actually only about half. Uh, it's thought that algae produce actually at least half. Some people think it's more than that. It's hard to, hard to say exactly, so that is an estimate to clarify, but it's actually a fairly conservative estimate. So they think that uh, about at least half the world's oxygen is produced by algae in the ocean. So that's an important reservoir for the production of oxygen. Okay, so uh, one more thing before I move on here. I, I don't have it listed here, but I want to point this out. Um, algae rarely cause disease. They are actually rarely pathogenic, and that's because they produce their own food by using sunlight. And so typically when an organism makes its own food, it doesn't require other organisms to parasitize. So uh, in other words, if you're kind of a free living, sun soaking organism that can kind of grow anywhere there's sunlight and water and a little bit of carbon dioxide, you don't need to parasitize another organism to get nutrients. So oftentimes for that reason, or I should say, um, for, for that reason, they are rarely ever parasitic. There actually are some exceptions, but those are just exceptions. So you won't find much discussion about algae in the context of a, uh, uh, of a medical uh, infection or uh, in terms of a um, disease or a significant issue to human health. Again, there are exceptions. We'll actually talk about some of those later, but I just wanted to point that out for now. The next group here are the fungi. And fungi are pretty interesting. Starting out, there are two different types, and we can refer to these, uh, go to the right over here. One, one way to think about fungi is that there are macro and microscopic fungi. So the macroscopic fungi are often referred to as the mushrooms, and these are what we know very well as mushrooms. So these are a type of fungi. The other type being microscopic are what we know as molds and yeasts. So these most most people are somewhat familiar with these, 
but oftentimes we don't think about them as being related to each other. So these big mushrooms that you see growing in the forest, maybe in your backyard, these are actually closely related to the microscopic types like the mold, for example, that you might find growing in a wet, uh, damp area, uh, as, well, as well as the yeast that ferment or alcohol or that we use to bake bread or sometimes that you know might cause a yeast infection. So they're all a little bit different but they're all related in that they all fit into this fungi grouping here. Uh, I want to point out another thing here that says all parasitic disease causing forms of fungi are microscopic. So these actually can grow inside the human body in the bodies of other animals. They can grow on uh, fruits and vegetables and they can cause mold and, and um, spoiling of food as you're probably well aware. Fungi, or excuse me, the mushrooms, the macroscopic fungi, rarely do that um, and they don't cause disease in people. So these, despite any urban myths, do not grow inside your body. They will not grow out of your ears or anything like that. Um, but these can. It's not actually common for these to do that, but it can happen. So these actually could establish in the human body and cause an infection. These cannot. The only time a macroscopic mushroom or macroscopic fungi would actually cause any issue is if you ate one that was poisonous. Okay, So that's the only time that those would ever be an issue is due to accidental ingestion. Now fungi, um, I like to point out, may actually look like they're related to plants. It's easy to think that fungi and plants are probably pretty closely related to each other. Again, most people probably don't think about these things, but if you were to think about it, it'd be easy to think that they're probably cousins or they're closely related in some sense. The truth is they're actually uh, very, very distant in terms of their relation to each other. In fact, to put it in perspective, you and I have more in common with fungi than fungi have in common with plants. So in other words, we're, you and I are more closely related to fungi than a fungi is to any plant out there. So they are very, very different. What they have in common is the fact that they tend to grow out of the ground and they're stationary. But that is about where the, different, about where the similarities end when it comes to plants and fungi. So fungi are actually more closely related to animals. And one of the ways in which that's actually relevant is how they feed. Fungi feed in a similar way to you and I as animals in that they break their food down with digestive enzymes. Okay, so think about how you eat. You put your food in your mouth, you chew it up, and you swallow it, and you put it in your stomach. And from there, your body releases digestive chemicals, they're called enzymes, that break that food down as it moves through your body. Fungi actually do something very similar. They actually just do it in a slightly different order. So what fungi actually do is release the enzymes first, then they break it down outside of their body, what you're seeing here, or like here's this kind of white fuzzy looking fungi, and they're breaking down this leaf, they're breaking down this tree. What they're actually doing is spewing the enzymes onto their food source and breaking it down outside of their body, outside of their cells. So it's kind of like you and I digesting something on the table and then swallowing it after it's broken down, kind of gross. They, that's how fungi actually feed. Um, so it's similar, just in a different order. Now, where that is significant is that because they break food out, because they break food down outside of their body, that actually helps recycle some of those nutrients back into the environment. So what, we'll, we'll focus on this later. I don't want to go too much more detail, but when they actually break the food down, it ends up releasing a lot of the nutrients back into the environment. So the soil, for example, can soak up a lot of the, the, the nutrients that the fungi are breaking down. The way, here's how I like to think about it. I like to think of a fungi, it feeds on its food kind of like a two-year-old, excuse me, a two-year-old feeds on a birthday cake. So if you've ever watched or if you ever have a two-year-old and you've given them a birthday cake for fun, you know that a two-year-old will maybe only consume about five or ten percent of that birthday cake and the other 90 percent or whatever it is ends up on the floor, ends up on the, the high chair, ends up on their face. So they're very messy eaters and fungi are very similar. They are messy eaters. So when they break their food down, a lot of it doesn't actually get absorbed. It ends up being released back into the environment and this allows for the recycling of larger nutrients uh, to be 
put back into the environment where they can be reabsorbed by other organisms. If that doesn't make perfect sense, uh, we'll come back to that later. So I don't want to go too much more because there is a topic in chapter seven where we go into that more detail. But for now, what I really want you to know, if that doesn't make sense, just recognize that fungi are important for breaking down and recycling non-living organic matter in the environment. So when a tree falls and it starts to rot, that rotting is actually due to the fungi. And what ends up happening is eventually the tree rots into nothing and all of the nutrients that were in that tree get put back into the environment. So the soil becomes enriched and other life forms can feed off of those nutrients in a way that benefits the entire environment and the entire ecosystem. So we take for granted the fact that things kind of break down and, and um, decompose, but that's actually almost entirely the work of fungi. And bacteria play a role and insects play a role too, but, but fungi are a big part of that process of breaking things down. So that's one of the, one of the big ways, ways in which they're significant. Outside of the fact that they cause disease, they're significant to the environment for that reason. Okay, the next one on the list here are the protozoa. Protozoa are probably the most odd group of microbes here. Very difficult to pinpoint. I found that out as I was trying to write down the specific uh, characteristics of protozoa. I realized there really aren't any. So this one's going to be a little bit tough to, to generalize here. Uh, it, it, generalizing the protozoa is kind of like generalizing all animals. Okay, everything from an insect to a fish to a human, those are technically all animals. So imagine trying to generalize all of those things. In other words, trying to talk about common characteristics of all of them. It's pretty difficult to do. And that's kind of how protozoa are. So they're a very, very broad group. Um, so what they do have in common, like the other organisms in our class here, they're microscopic. These are single-celled, so they're actually a single-celled eukaryotic organism. And um, because they're a eukaryote, their cells are about 10 times larger than the bacteria. So refer back to this here. So if this is a eukaryotic organism, this could be a prokaryote, or excuse me, a uh, protozoa, and this might be a bacteria. So both are single-celled. One is eukaryotic, the other prokaryotic, but they would be significantly different in size. I put some pictures here to show you some different examples. Uh, each one of these is a real image of a prokaryote, but uh, obviously a lot of variation here. Um, a few more generalizations. Protozoa are not nearly as ubiquitous as bacteria. So they're somewhat common, but these are not going to be found on every surface. They're not going to be found floating through the air. Where they're most commonly found is in the soil and the water. So especially water, if you take a pond water sample, you'll find lots and lots of protozoa. If you pull up a chunk of soil and you really study it, you'd find lots and lots of protozoa. So that's where they tend to be most commonly found. Now they can be found in the human body. As humans, we do carry some protozoa around. Uh, they could be found other places, but they're just not that, they're not as ubiquitous. So these are not organisms that you just find anywhere and everywhere you go. They, they tend to be found mostly in the soil and the water. That's where they kind of reside as their primary habitat. Now, they, even though they're kind of scary looking, the majority of these are harmless, as in the case with most microbes. However, for those that are pathogenic, they actually cause quite a bit of problem, uh, quite a bit of problems throughout the world. Uh, as an example, malaria. Malaria, as we'll learn a little bit more about here and you'll read about in the textbook, is a significant issue. Uh, and even though it only exists of a, of a few handful of species, there's actually about four species of malaria, uh, they actually or make, they make up millions of infections each year. So just a couple of species of a larger, of, of many tens of thousands, cause millions of infections and even millions of, of, de of deaths each year. So these are actually um, can be quite nasty for, for the small percent of those that actually do cause disease. Again, those are tough to summarize there, so that's all I have for the protozoa. I do want to kind of uh, go back and just compare algae and protozoa, and I think that might help understand the two better, especially the protozoa. So both of these are part of the protista kingdom. Let me just back up real quick. When I talked about the eukaryotic organisms, I said there's four groups here, and the protists include the algae and the protozoa. So even though they're different, they're classified within this, what we call the protist 
uh, Protista kingdom. So they're actually related in that sense. The Pro Protista kingdom is a group that's defined by being single-celled eukaryotic organisms. Okay, so in other words, all the or all the organisms in this kingdom are single-celled. What is different about the two is that each gets their food from a very unique, uh, in, a, in a very unique way compared to the other. Uh, as we already said, algae are photosynthetic. Protozoa are non-photosynthetic and acquire their food in a variety of ways that uh, is unique to each one. But the, the idea that I want you to think about here is that, as I mentioned earlier, algae are kind of like miniature plants. But in that context, you can think of protozoa as almost like miniature single-celled animals. So imagine how animals feed. They often have a mouth and they swallow things and they chew it up and they digest it. Plants absorb sunlight and CO2 and, and water uh, and get their food that way. And, and really, from that standpoint, that's exactly how protozoa work. Protozoa tend to swallow things and, and digest them, um, and algae tend to absorb sunlight and water and uh, get their energy that way. Here's a quick image of a protozoa swallowing a food source. Now, this is not how all protozoa feed. There's, again, very, very uh, diverse group, but uh, just to give you at least one example, here's a protozoa. This, this big thing here, this is the protozoa, and it's actually swallowing a food source. I believe that's a bacteria it's actually feeding off of there. So that would eventually wrap that thing up, and eat it, and use it for food. And so you can kind of get a visual there as to how protozoa would go about feeding. So in that sense, they're like a little miniature animal cell. And in fact, the term protozoa literally means first animal. It's actually what that means uh, in a Latin translation. So that might help you understand those two a little bit better. So miniature plants, miniature animals. Next on the list are what we call the helminths. Helminths are defined as parasitic worms. These have the potential to be the largest on the list of microbes. And in fact, in the full, fully developed adult life stage, they're really not microscopic at all. They can actually become really large, fairly disgusting, I know. Uh, but the reason they're studied in microbiology is because when they're infectious, they are microscopic. And that is typically at the life stage of the egg and or the larva. And what you see up here, these are all pictures of the egg stage. And these are all microscopic images because they're very, very tiny. So, so you would not be infected at the adult stage when these worms are very large and grotesque. You would be infected at the microscopic stage when the worm is invisible to you. And for that reason, it's relevant to microbiology because the actual infection occurs during the microscopic life stage. Uh, and to clarify, these are actually part of the animal kingdom, one of the only microbes from the animal kingdom that we'll study here in the microbiology. Last but not least are the viruses. Viruses are, to me, one of the more interesting groups. And that has to do with the fact that they're actually a bit of an outlier from the other microbes in that they're technically considered non-living. Um, so it says here, viruses are referred to as infectious particles. And by our own definitions, by, by our own, I mean by scientific definitions, probably how I should have stated that, by the scientific definition, viruses are considered non-living. So what that basically, to, just to parse it out a little bit further here, at some point, scientists put together a list of what a living thing is. Uh, and in other words, what are, what are the characteristics that make up a living thing? So we, we talked about prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So those are both examples of living things. So they have a cell membrane, they have DNA, they have a fluid inside their cell, um, they have the ability to replicate, they have the ability to take in nutrients and expel waste, and there's uh, more to that. But those are some ideas of what every living thing is capable of doing. So you have this kind of list of here's what a living thing is. So when scientists put that list together, they actually didn't know what a virus was. So at that time, no one had actually discovered viruses. Viruses were not discovered until later when microscopic techniques became more advanced. So once they discovered what these were, they realized they actually don't fit the, the description of previously discovered life forms. So they ultimately were classified as a non-living infectious particle. And that really has to just simply do with 
the characteristics of what we kind of arbitrarily define as a living thing. A lot of people think that the characteristic of life should be changed to include viruses. In other words, you should reduce that to make sure viruses fit into the list of living things. Uh, but that's, that's neither here nor there. It's arbitrary. It doesn't change what they are or how they work. It's just simply how they're classified. So as of now, they're classified as non-living based on that kind of arbitrary distinction. What we want to know about viruses is starting out their strict intracellular parasites. What that means is that they actually have to get inside of another living cell in order to replicate and in order to thrive, so to speak. Since they're not really alive, we use the word thrive instead of live. So basically, they, they exist simply to infect cells, living cells, replicate, and go on to do it again. So they, they have to actually come in contact with the living cell in order to replicate themselves to make copies to go on and repeat that process. In other words, their entire existence is predicated on infecting living cells and making copies of themselves. Uh, now, there's lots of different types of viruses, and as we are, as you're probably already aware, some of them are quite nasty. This actually here is a picture of the rabies virus. This here is a picture of the influenza virus. This here is a picture of the Ebola virus. This is actually a picture of a, vi of a virus that infects bacteria. We'll talk about those. By the way, in chapter six, uh, we'll talk all about viruses. So the entire topic of chapter six is dedicated to viruses. Uh, over here, I believe, is the polio virus. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, and I'll come back to this in chapter six, is that while we tend to think of viruses as being infectious to humans and animals, the truth is that viruses actually infect every living thing on Earth, including bacteria, including algae, including protozoa and fungi, and plants. So it's not just humans and animals that have viral infection, it's li literally everything. And so these here, for example, are viruses that only infect bacteria. So they are really common, uh, even though they don't always infect us, they're around and they infect other living things uh, as well. Okay, last section. I'm going to try and keep this video under an hour. So I'm going to go through this last part kind of fast. And you can go back and look at the PowerPoints and uh, go through that in more detail if you'd like. Most of the stuff you can just simply read and get the information. But I want to explain it to you just a little bit, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. So I understand I intend to go through this fast, and you may have to go back and look at it in the, uh, the PowerPoints. So microbial pathogens starting out. These are microbes that cause disease, probably fairly obvious. As I mentioned earlier, most microbes are not pathogenic, uh, only about 5%, give or take, which still makes up over 2,000 just human microbes. So there's a lot of them, even though the percentage is relatively small. So there's literally millions of microbes out there, and a couple thousand cause disease. So it's a, a still a large number, several thousand that are, are harmful, but by percentage, it's a relatively small overall percent of the whole. Now, our textbook has divided the types of pathogens that affect humans. So to clarify, we're looking here at microbes that affect humans. Uh, this could be other animals too. This could be like dogs and cats and horses, but for the most part it's centered around human disease here. Uh, so it's classified the pathogens based on the body systems that they infect. Um, so skin and eyes, nervous, cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, etc. Now what I've got here are just a couple of, uh, just about one example for each of these systems here to give you an idea of uh, some of the different types of microbes in the body areas that they infect. So with the first one, I started with a common example, which is uh, Staphylococcus, uh, more commonly, Staphylococcus aureus, excuse me, a type of bacteria, often more commonly known as MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now, I don't normally make you spell out the full name of a microbe, but I am going to with this one in particular, okay? So I want you to be able to spell this whole big, long, crazy thing here. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. You're going to have to take a little bit of time and just spell that out and practice it. Again, I won't make you do that very, I won't make you do that commonly, but I will with this one because this is really, really common. And I want you to be familiar with what MRSA is and what it, you know, starting with just the name of it. Okay, so it's actually a type of bacteria. The bacteria is called Staphylococcus aureus. And this one in particular, MRSA, is actually a substrain of that so it's actually a type of Staphylococcus aureus. 
And the name comes from the fact that this particular type are resistant to antibiotics. All right, so MRSA is basically a antibiotic resistant type of Staphylococcus aureus. These bacteria are common in the body. Uh, this one in particular, however, is more pathogenic. And one of the reasons for that is it releases toxins and enzymes that can actually break down the skin and, and cause what's called necrosis, death of body tissue. The nervous system can be infected by a, par a parasite called Nigleria fowleri. I will not make you spell this one. This one's not as common. Uh, it does make its way into the news, unfortunately, once or twice a year, sometimes more. Nigleria is a type of protozoa. That's actually a real picture, by the way. Um, it's kind of got it's a certain angle to it. They don't all quite look like that, but that one has a real sinister look that they were able to capture with just the right angle. Uh, under a microscope. So that actually is a real picture, even though they don't all look exactly like that. Uh, anyway, this one's often referred to as the brain-eating amoeba, and that's because it can get into the body through the nasal passage, often when you're swimming uh, in a, in a um, typically it's in a, like a lake or a pond or a, uh, sometimes a river. Uh, oftentimes it's someone who's diving or they're kind of pushing their head into the water, often with force, you know, diving or skiing. Uh, so water gets forced up into the nasal passage, and if there's that parasite in the water, it can actually cling to the back of the nasal passage and actually burrow into the body and make its way to the brain, where it causes a really unfortunate disease called meningoencephalitis. And uh, that is basically inflammation of the brain and the spinal cord, or the brain and the meninges, which is the covering around the brain and the spinal cord. It's kind of the protective tissue layer around those two areas. So when those become inflamed, it's often fatal. It's very difficult to stop that. And uh, unfortunately, it's oftentimes young children who get infected and their immune system isn't quite able to stop the infection. And they're unfortunately the ones that tend to succumb to it. Although it's extremely rare, maybe only a couple cases that are documented a year, those that do get the infection almost always succumb to it. It's almost always fatal. I think there's been a few cases of people who've survived it, but the, the, the death rate is... is something like 98 or 98% or higher. It's unfortunately extremely common for that to end in tragedy. So for that reason, they call it the brain-eating amoeba. That's oftentimes what the media calls it when they talk about it in the news. So if you've heard of it, you've heard it for that reason. Next one is uh, a microbe that can actually infect almost any part of the body. I have it listed here as the cardiovascular system that tends to be where it enters the body. Uh, but this is a microbe called Borrelia burgdorferi. I won't make you spell that one, but I want you to recognize it. Same with this one, by the way. I want you to recognize this one, but I won't make you spell them. So just be able to identify those on like a multiple choice. But Borrelia burgdorferi, burgdorferi excuse me, is the causative agent of Lyme disease. So I want you to know that as well. And as you may already know, Lyme disease is transmitted through ticks, specifically a type called the black-legged deer tick. So this microbe, the actual causative agent the Borrelia burgdorferi is what you see here. It's a spiral-shaped bacteria, and oftentimes these are referred to as a corkscrew bacteria. And that's because they have the ability to literally twist and turn and kind of corkscrew their way through your body. So the tick carries these bacteria in their mouth, and when they bite you, they infect you with these bacteria. And then those bacteria enter into the tissue and start causing damage based on the way that they kind of twist and turn into your flesh. That, in turn, leads to damage and inflammation and ultimately can cause long-term issues depending on where you're infected uh, and if you get treatment and how quickly you get treatment. Most people who get infection have what's called the, the bullseye rash, is what you see here. Uh, that happens in about 70 to 80 percent of patients. So if, if you ever have a tick bite and you get that kind of rash, go to the doctor. Take a picture of it too, by the way. Sometimes it doesn't always look quite like that. Here's a picture where the bullseye is a little bit off target, so to speak. So any kind of weird rash like that that's, that's found after a tick bite, do not mess around with that. Immediately get treatment, immediately go to a doctor, and make sure they know uh, what's happening there. Most of the time, if you get treatment early, you won't have any long-term issues. People can have long-term issues with, with Lyme disease if they don't get early treatment and if that treatment... Um, is not effective. So unfortunately, even in about 20, 10 to 20% of people who do get early treatment, they can still develop long-term issues with Lyme disease. So this disease is becoming more common, 
and it's more and more likely each year that people will pick it up. Real quick here is some information about how to remove a tick. Uh, basically, there's some myths about, and mentioned down here, they call it folklore remedies, painting it with nail polish or using a, a match to try and heat it out. They basically have said that those are really not effective. They, it's not to say they could never work, but uh, aren't the most effective way. The most effective way, according to the CDC, is to use tweezers and to make sure to grab it near the head and to actually put pressure on the tick and don't actually try to rip it out. Uh, basically, you want to pull on the tick and let it let the tick release itself. So let the tick release its head. Don't rip the head out because the head is actually where the bacteria are. So if you rip the head out, uh, leaving it inside the body, then you can actually still tra have the bacteria transmitted. Whereas if you pull the tick out and you keep the head intact, then in theory, I should say it's just less likely that you'll have the bacteria. At that point, it depends on how long the tick has been on you. They say it typically takes about 24 hours for the transmission of the bacteria to occur. So in other words, if a tick just bit you, let's say you pull it off within the first hour of it being on you, and you do it correctly with the tweezers, odds are you won't have any infection even if the tick carries Lyme disease. Um, however, it does recommend keeping the tick in alcohol and sealing it in case there is an issue later and that would be ideal because if you actually have the tick they could they could test the tick to see exactly what it was carrying in case you ever get sick so that's kind of going to the extreme but you know in today's world it's hard you can't be too careful oops i shouldn't click that so it's a good idea to uh to do that if you're uh, if you have the supplies with you and uh, in case you get sick later you will uh have fewer issues or i should say excuse me it would be easier to diagnose and treat that if that was the case this is just a real quick map because it goes back as late as 2014 showing the increase of, of diagnosed incidents of Lyme disease in the U.S. So if you look real carefully, the, the concentration has gone up and the distribution has increased throughout the U.S., especially in the Northeast, although these, these maps change each year. I haven't seen a more updated since 2014, but uh, it's thought that they're increasing in geographic range. Next is a an example of a respiratory infection, and this is the common influenza virus. So this is our, our flu virus. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but we have uh, several types. Type A and B are the most common, but there's also a type C. A and B tend to cause the most severe symptoms, which is why we tend to focus on those. Uh, C rarely causes se severe, severe issues, so you might have it and never even get treatment be or even realize that you're sick because it tends to be very mild and self-limiting. So uh, typically it's respiratory, uh, excuse me, influenza viruses A and B that give us the most issue. Um, what viruses essentially do is they attach to a cell, insert themselves into the cell, replicate, and then make lots of copies and then burst out of the cell. It doesn't show it here, but it's actually kind of destroying the cell on the way out. So viruses are kind of like a, a horde of people that come into a house, they break into a house, they destroy the house, and then on the way out, they kind of burn it down behind them. So they're, they're, they, they basically kind of break in, tear everything apart from the inside, and then kind of burn it down on the way out. And so when a virus infects the cell, that's essentially what it's doing. Um, and the key to surviving a viral infection is having a healthy immune system that stops the virus from doing that at a fast rate. So if your immune system is healthy, you'll fight off the cells faster than what they can destroy too many of them. So they'll always infect a certain number of cells, but not so many that you have long-term issues and your body can build new cells. So as long as you're healthy, odds are you'll get viruses from time to time, but your body will fight them off and your body will rebuild the cells that have been damaged within a relatively short period of time. Typically, it's people that have a poor immune system that succumb to viral infection. Now, there are genetic differences, sometimes a genetic defect or just a difference, not even a defect, really, but a difference in genetic makeup can make certain people more susceptible to one virus or another. So it's not always about immune uh, health. Sometimes it is genetic differences that are, unfortunately, what account for why some people might die from a virus and why other people might survive it. Um, each year, 3,000 to almost 50,000 people die from influenza. 
most of these are elderly. Most of these are people who are in a nursing home or who are too uh, weak immune, uh, have too weak of an immune system to fight off the infection. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna put this link on the online in the resources section. This is kind of a cool video uh, showing some animation of a video of a virus and how it would infect a cell and what that might look like from a computer animation standpoint. So it's just a couple minutes and uh, it's a nice visual for those of you that want to look at that. And the last part here is an example of a microbe that affects the the genitourinary system. This is a microbe called Trichomonas vaginalis, one of the more common types of STDs. It's actually an example of a protozoa. So here's a couple different images. These are all real images here. Some low resolution and a high resolution image here. Uh, this is an example of a, of a pathogenic protozoa, one that is sexually transmitted. Uh, considered the most common curable STD, meaning it can be cured with medication. The most common incurable is the HPV human papillomavirus. So those are the two most common. HPV, however, has no common cure Although there is a vaccine for it, there's no cure once you have it, whereas uh, Trichomonas vaginalis has uh, a treatment which is taken through oral medication. All right, so that's the last example there of a microbe that affects the genitourinary system.